ിമാസുമീം ഹുസൈനിമ ഹനീഫീനീനുൽ <laughs> In the light of the present crisis in the world, in the area of economics as much as in the area of politics then also i think in some sense in the area of defining the boundaries of religion it is heartening to know that the quran is talking directly to all of us whether we are the followers of this religion or not it applies to all of us as human beings this universal dimension of the quranic message is striking and it is amazing to see the vision that the quran provides for us for the generations to come as much as to us as contemporaries who are listening to this lecture <coughs> the search for that religion which can talk to our nature is extremely palatable to the modern men and women they like to do that confessional organized religions are not attracting the people but there is one kind of search and if one can establish that my nature is in conformity with my spirituality then there is room to develop a kind of religiosity that can speak across boundaries i'm searching for something that you and i can present to the world at large in other words we want to speak to the world in which converted and non converted listeners are there and therefore our search for this deen al qayyim this religion that speaks to our nature is a very real one today you and i want something that is compatible compatible to our nature to our needs human beings need things we there is a quest for peace there is a search for identity and all these confusions in the modern period are not generating enough confidence in us religious ethics in the university is growing field by the way now you will be surprised to learn 
that today many graduate students want to do religious ethics rather than theology. The applicants we get in the university in the graduate program, we have theology, ethics, and culture, TEC. And majority of applicants are in this subfield of religious studies. And the reason is very simple. We are learning very quickly that if the world is to survive the present crisis, you might be wondering what crisis am I speaking about? There is truly a crisis where there is the certainty of 10 years ago is not more is no more there. What we felt good about 10 years ago is no more there to assure us that this will continue. Our faith in the material world is gradually eroding. We are not comfortable anymore by saying that I am doing very well economically. Because that has not guaranteed the happiness you and I are looking for. And something that we want to leave for our children in future. Because I am sure, with the education that we are giving to our children, they will be able to stand on their own feet. The professional walls are not going to run down. They are there. Although the young people are telling me there is saturation of the lawyers, there is saturation of the physicians, I am saying that there is going to be, bound to be, a need for them all the time. But we should not worry about that because Allah God provides with to you know for our livelihood. Who thought we would be able to come here and work and be able to sit tonight here and say that Alhamdulillah, at least we have food on our table. More than that. Why religious ethics has become important? And why comparative ethics has become important is for you and me to understand tonight. I have, I'm leading you in this journey with it, and you have been my fellow travelers for these few nights. And I know that, that every day there are new faces that I see. They come, they join because they were not able to see, to come previous, previous nights. Therefore then it is appropriate for me just briefly to say that we search for ways in which we can avoid being biased. We search for ways in which we could be objective in ret retrieval of our tradition. I think Charles Taylor has made very clear that we are in ethical space. But ethical space is also secular space. This is, by the way, the professor at the University of Toronto. He is one of the very big shots, what I see as far as thought and intellectual contribution to the modern discussions about tradition's role in secular society is concerned. In other words, you and I are really concerned about what can tradition do for us when the modern society is moving in a specific, a specific direction, and we can't follow it very quickly because it is moving at a speed that you, can, uh, you and I cannot catch it. That's the fact. What we are searching for is that while we get a knowledge about ethics, while we get a knowledge about our religion, while we become more and more acquainted with our tradition, we also want to find out if our moral judgment is correct or not. Knowledge should lead us. We are not looking for knowledge for the sake of knowledge. We are looking for knowledge for the sake of human life, human future, our relationships, our connections with one another our global connections with global society as a whole, 
In other words, we are not simply looking at art for the sake of art or knowledge for the sake of knowledge. We are seeing something very powerful to run, to make us wish to reach that goal as quickly as possible. And what is that? Our ability to make moral judgment. Our ability to say this is right, this is wrong. In other words, the quest for knowledge should lead us to the pursuit of good. And that good is not limited only to the spiritual good or religious good. I'm talking about comprehensive good in the society. We are looking at the success of human beings in different dimensions. Because human being is multidimensional. We are not satisfied in one type of life. We are seeking for something new that would satisfy our curiosity about our own selves. Remember we said in the first lecture that the struggle is to know yourself. The struggle is to understand yourself. How can you understand yourself if you are unaware of the environment in which you are living? It requires us to know broadly where we are living, the time in which we are living, the conditions that you and I need to understand so that we can find solutions to the problems we are faced with. And our problems, by the way, are in the area of ethics. It is in the area of how to treat one another in fairness, how to treat in one another with justice, how to be kind to one another, how to protect the rights of those who are being crushed in the society, the rights of those who need protection in different ways. In other words, our commitments are much, much larger. That's what I call Islamic vision. If Islam was content with the vision that applies only to Muslims, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given us a very different directive in the Quran. For Hanifa. This religion that I am talking about, Allah is telling us, is the religion which needs to be completely understood. And it needs our total attention. We can't be partially connected to this religion. In other words, what we are talking about is a total immersion in the religion. We are only partially immersed in the religion. Because we are occupied with different aspects of our living. This seminar on Sunday, I'm not promoting it, by the way. I'm simply suggesting to you that don't miss it because what it gives us is an, is an opportunity interactively here I'm talking you have hundreds of questions coming to your mind and you can't ask them immediately isn't it true you're wondering where am I taking you and you want to raise your hand and say could you please stop and say something about this this is not possible in a lecture the way it has been designed and the mode in which it is delivered. But well, on Sunday we expect to do something more. We want to talk about all these matters that we have been discussing all these nights in a form of a seminar. Why I am talking about it? The simple reason is that that knowledge that you and I are looking for is not monologue. No. It's not only me who should speak and you should listen. No, that's not the way to learn. It's dialogical. You speak, I listen. I speak, you listen. I disagree, you disagree. We come to a conclusion and we talk about a common ground that we all have in common interest. The format of the Madlis is not usually dialogical. We need to engage in conversation today. And the reason is very simple. We want to find our knowledge is mutually in agreement with our ethical values. What we know about ourselves also should reflect in our action. Our action is ethically informed action. 
we want to leave a mark on this earth when we leave. People should not say these are the ones who kill fellow human beings. We want to know, we want to know but for surety what we do ethically is so well remembered that one day people say they live loving and caring for one another. How can that be possible if we don't talk to one another? A seminar format then is a format that is naturally geared towards increasing what we call the conversation between one another. Why is there a need for the conversation? Because it is in the conversation that we can learn competitive ethics. I want to learn about your feelings. If I don't talk to you, I will never learn about you. I want to understand why are you happy or why are you sad. If I don't talk to you, I will never understand it. When I hear you talking to me, then I'm also required to react to it in a moral fashion. In an ethical way. I'll give you a very small example. We came last year and we lived in Toronto for the whole year. Our idea of living in Toronto was that we are in the midst of the community. There are people who know us, there are people, we know them. And therefore we can live a much better communicative, cumulative life than we live in Virginia. Because we are in a very small place, in Charlottesville is a university town. There isn't much, there's no community. So we live in a very limited space, so to speak. What we were searching for in Toronto last year, and this is very honest assessment of my own you know, experience of the whole year, but we were not able to con we were not able to establish conversation with many of our friends whom we know in this city. Because we never saw them. We never saw them. Not that they don't care for us. No, I don't think so. They always were very considerate. Professor in the university, very busy. How can we disturb him? That's why we need seminars. That's why we need an opportunity to talk to one another. We don't talk enough to one another. Yes, I know we do a lot of noise when the when the is over there. I don't know what we talk about. I'm I'm not interested to find out, you know. But I, I know we talk about so many issues, perhaps, you know, my aunt is sick or my father is, you know, doing, not doing well. We might do that, but what I'm talking about is our ability to exchange ideas. This is religious ethics. God created us as human beings, not automatons. You know... <laughs> I read this passage here. Darwin has demonstrated that Rousseau's natural Eden does not resemble a machine. Because they thought we were, we were like machines. We act and think like machines do. Rather, Darwin said it resembles a jungle. In other words, we are, you know, in the state of a jungle. But it is a jungle that reaches a state of equilibrium, a balanced state, through the invisible hand of the struggle for survival. This is what Darwin said, the survival of the fittest. The one who can really live this through this jungle is the one who can survive the most. Then Freud came along. This is, this is modern secular culture, by the way. Then Freud comes along, scientifically and objectively, according to some at least, because there is a lot of rethinking about what Freud said. Today they are criticizing him. There is a lot of rethinking psychology, by the way. That the jungle lies inside human being. That's what Freud said. This jungle in which you and I are you know, living, this was an idea, you know, that Rousseau said, the state of nature, so to speak. According to Darwin, that state of nature was a jungle. And Freud came along and said, no, that jungle is in you, within you. 
What is it doing? In the form of dark, unconscious, and explosive libido. We are very, very much, you know, you know, controlled by our sexuality, our sex desires, our dreams, everything boils down to one thing. Sexual satisfaction. This is Freud. Look at the modern culture. Then comes along Pavlo. We all studied psychology, by the way, in the university. I took a course in university. And they talk about Pavlo. What did he do? He conducted experiments on dogs. And then applied the results of the experiment to human beings. And his, his, his conclusions are amazing. Oh, we have accepted it, by the way. You and I, in the university, we still talk about Paolo in a very, very respect, respectful way. And what did he say? Assume that there were no essential differences between one and the other, that is, between the dogs and human beings. There were no differences. Well, what was it about then? Since each is governed by his instincts and by his nervous system. Nerves. This is, in brief, the story that has controlled us all these years, by the way. There's a lot of rethinking. I must tell you, there's a lot of insight, rethinking. There's a lot of criticism. We have an institute of advanced studies in cultural studies in the University of Virginia. The whole purpose of this institution, by the way, funded richly by some of the American donors. This is not university money. Private donors have funded the institute. The function of this institute is to critically evaluate modernity. So when we are studying modernity, when I mentioned last night that they have told us there is only one paradigm that you need to apply in order for you to become successful, prosperous. You and I have agreed, although that paradigm is monodimensional, not only moral dimensional, it is refusing to recognize monotheism. Now let me tell you something. The belief in Tawheed, by the way, belief in Tawheed leaves you free as human beings. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Belief in Tawheed, by the way, separates God from the creation. La ilaha illallah. God is separated from the creation. It's not pantheistic. Like some of the Hindu philosophers would tell us. It's not monism. That the one spirit of God is in everything in the world. Though he simply says that affirming affirmation of the divine unity, affirmation that la ilaha illallah means that you human beings are on a different plane and God is on a different plane but your plane has a lot of freedom with it for you. Because you decide what you want to do with your life. The weed then actually sets us free because what it does is that it gives us a source of our values and it ties us to the source to which we should look for values. al jamaa al qiyam a society with values. What the modern society is saying that there are no values. Our paradigm has no values. You don't have to respect your parents. No, there is no such value. The value is materialism. The value is rationalism. But that rationalism is so individualistic that it separates the individual from all its connections, natural ones. You have no obligation to take care of your old parents? Who said we have that obligation? In the modern culture, actually, you as a child is given authority, you know, in the court to appear and say that, I don't want to, care of, to take care of my, my parents. What the government has done is that, okay, we'll provide social security for them, so that they will be independent from you. What does Sharia say? Do you remember? If the parents are old, it is the duty of the eldest son to provide for them. If the elder son doesn't do it, the second son does it. If all the sons refuse to help the parents, then the daughter does it. Daughter's obligation is much later. 
Because daughter is seen to be, you know, dependent on someone else. This is how the culture is, you know, defined. The, the heaven defined daughter as an independent economic power, so to speak. Now, when you look at this kind of contradiction, therefore then you need nursing homes to take care of your parents, provided you have funds for it. Now, if you don't have the funds, government says, we will provide it. In other words, the function of the human society is slain, is taken over by the institutions created by the government. The government says, we'll protect their rights. By the way, there is nothing wrong with it. I'm, I'm not criticizing the institutions. What I'm saying is, is the kind of situation in which we find ourselves. We find ourselves in such a situation in which we and I have lost connection with the ethical values with which we were brought up, with which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us. And it made it so clear for us that this is the values we will learn. And Allah will not change those values. God will not change anything in creation because you need to discover that. So all biases then in the Western epistemological paradigm or the paradigm in which we learn about modern values is emanates with these firm commitments. That's the, mod the modern society is saying to us. We are, as human beings, self-contained. We don't need anyone. We don't need anyone, by the way. We are all self-contained. We are self-operating. We are self-regulating moral agents. I don't have to be told by my, by my parents what is right and wrong. I know it myself. It is part of me, as St. Augustine said, it is part of your nature. You know it. We are also self-activating. We don't need someone to wake us up for the namaz in the morning. Not even alarm clock. We don't know you. We, we can activate ourselves if we want to do it. If we want to do it, we can do it. In other words, there is a total independence of, a, of an individual from all kinds of connections that might become necessary in social living. Interestingly, we are also self-explanatory. We don't need, you know, to listen to you. I don't need to listen to Bashir. I don't need to listen to Hussein. I'm more, I'm more capable. I can explain myself my own situation. And therefore, I still remember when I told my son, you have to get married. And he told me, that's my life. You don't tell me what to do. Yeah, I mean, he told me that, you know, very honestly. He said, no, you don't make the decision for us. I said, no. The prophet has told me, unless you get married, I am not going to be at peace. No parents should sleep in peace until the children are properly married and settled. So my sons asked me, where did you get from? Where did you get that from? Very naturally, right? Can, well, you know, I, you are telling me I should obey you. I should get married. Where did you get that from? I said, I know, because that's what my, I've been taught in Islam. I'm supposed to take care. You are my son. I'm supposed to take care of you until you become 40 years old. So what? 40 years old? You're interfering in my life. Look at this. Look at this situation in which we find ourselves. You're interfering in my life. You have no right to do that. I said, no, I have every right because your life is not your life. It's our life. I said, son, if I go to jail tomorrow, would you be concerned about me or not? Or you would say, that's my father's business. Let him go to jail. So, no, I will be concerned. Then how can you tell me that I, cannot, I should not be concerned because you are still single? You should be married. That's what the prophet told me. Don't sleep in peace until your children are married. By the way, these values are, you know, I'm trying to, this is self-explanation. More than men and women think they are self-explanatory. They don't need to, you know, explain to anyone. I'm not accountable to anyone. You know, you see this. By the way, the self-confidence is very, very important. I'm not, I'm not denying the existence of self-confidence. What I'm worried about is that it sees 
human being as a self-regulating individual not connected to anything. Once you do that, that paradigm doesn't work with you and me. If that's the paradigm we want, Rousseau's paradigm, I think this is where Charles Teller was very important. He said, no community can afford to ignore its tradition. However secular they become, they are connected with their tradition. They have to respect their tradition. In fact, they should always sit in conversation with their tradition. Because secular space is open to negotiations. That's the good thing about secular space. It allows you the freedom to negotiate. What happens is that before you negotiate, that they already condition your mind in all these things that I have told you. I'm independent, I don't need anyone. You remember this hadith that I mentioned some years ago in, your, in, in our gathering? That in one day Imam Ali was praying when the Prophet ﷺ overheard him. He was saying, Allahumma la, la yahwajni anin nafs. Don't make me, you know, dependent upon any human beings. We say that, by the way, you know, haven't you heard your mother, your mother, your father saying, I hope that day doesn't come when I need, I need you or I need anyone else. May God not make me need her. <laughs> by the way, there's prayer. And I'm, the Prophet ﷺ said, no, you can't pray that. People need one another. What are you talking about? He's telling his own student, my money, you can't pray like that. You need other human beings. Pray to God that, Ya Allah, only make me need those who are good. Don't make me depend on those who are evil. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala We need one another. If we need one another, then there has to be ethics. Now you're with me. If we need one another, then there has to be an ethics. Then I should be connected with you, not selfishly, but unselfishly. It's not only when I need you, I call you out. There should be a time also when I don't need you, I still call you out. I still ask about you. In other words, what we are being taught is a very strong sense of altruism. This is a major issue, for example, in organ donation. I have two kidneys, I need only one. I have somebody in my family or someone in my, you know, in my wife's family, who need one of my knee, my kidneys? <coughs> and it fits their blood, you know, it is histocompatible as, as the medical professions would say. So, I have to make a decision. Should I give my kidney or not? The ethical values are that you cannot harm yourself. If you're going to harm yourself, you have no, you should not even consider donating one of your kidneys. You should never do that. Because what if you become even much more sick than what you are? You might lose your health, healthy situation. In other words, the value that is being taught by this paradigm of Islam is that la dharar wa la dirar fil Islam. You must reject harm. If somebody is causing you harm, you must stand up against it. In the hospital they say, you must take this medication, you know, and you know that it doesn't work for you. In Islam, we give the patient the right to say, no doctor, I will, not take that. I will not take that medication at all. When I said this in the University of Toronto, they were surprised that we have a right to reject harm in Islamic ethics. I have a right to do it. You are causing me harm. By you, by you doing some there certain things, it's not going to help me. I have a right to reject it. Also, I have an obligation not to answer harm with harm. You harming me, I should not take upon myself to harm you. No. Reciprocal harm is not allowed. So there comes a question in biomedical ethics. I'm, I'm working in the hospital. I'm a social worker. Because I sit there in ethics committee. When these decisions are made, I'm being sent to Cairo. I'm being sent to Najaf. I'm being sent to Tehran. And I'm going to talk to the people in those cultures. 
Well, altruism is very, is very much, by the way, part of the culture. You do make sacrifices, by the way, if your daughter needs your kidney. She is on dialysis. And you are the one who can help. Then it becomes, it's not watching by the Shara. No, I'm not talking about the Sharia. I'm not talking about the Wujubu Sharia. I'm talking about Wujubu Akli. I'm talking about rational necessity for you to do the sacrifice to save your girl, to save your daughter. Now, there are, you know, there are cases whereby in the modern situation, my colleague Jim Childress, who works on the ethics, he, said, he tells me, you, you know, that in the modern situation, you know, in, the, in American hospitals, there have been cases. Because of the value system is such, the husband and the wife are called in by the doctor, and the doctor says, you know, your kidney is compatible to your, to your daughter. So if you want to donate it, donate it. But the doctors do it, by the way, in confidentiality. Husband and wife don't come together. He talks first to the husband, then to the wife. But the husband knows very well. He says to the doctor, please don't tell my wife that I'm histocompatible to give my kidney to my daughter. Because... If she finds out, and if I don't give that kidney, she will divorce me. The culture difference, by the way. You don't hear that in Cairo. Yes, by the way, in the Cairo also you hear it. These days, a Shirin Hamdi has, has, you know, has done the field work. Even in Cairo, you know, by the way, if you have donated a kidney, and if they find out that you are a girl, they don't marry you, because you only one kidney. Prejudices, which are, you know, I don't know whether I imagine or not, but this is what is happening. <coughs> in other words, the value system is altruistic. Now, you know, in America and in, in Canada, I'm sure they say, this is the gift of life. That's how they encourage you to give, to donate your bodily parts, your organs. This is a gift of life. I don't know if the gift of life is really convincing, if my wife disagrees with it. Or if my spouse disagrees with it. In other words, we are caught up into a system in, more in which your learned ethics is not going to respond to you. What I'm suggesting here is that the organizing principle in Islamic ethical environment is sacrifice. You are required. It is the highest virtue that is seen in you. Your ability to sacrifice. Your ability to do something out of your way. This is an Islamic value. <coughs> and they say, by the way, this is also Christian value. I don't talk about secular value, but it is certainly a Christian value in which you make that sacrifice to save somebody's life. Now, that kind of valuation of human life and human interaction sometimes get lost in the monodimensional paradigm of the modernity that the West is imposing and on entire world, by the way. Because what we found out was that the doctors in Tehran, the doctors in Cairo, the doctors in Najaf, they are all informed by the same kind of secular world. Yes, the nurses are different. I remember being hospitalized in Tehran and my nurse was reading Ayatul Kursi on me. I heard I was half asleep, half you know, awake, and I hear somebody reciting Ayatul Kursi. So I saw him. This was my nurse. She said, Our doctor, inshallah, who be she? And I, I don't hear my nurses in the University of Virginia telling me that, oh, I'm praying to God and you will be fine. No, I think there's a professionalism there. You don't talk about that though, in such a language. But the culture in which, from which we come from generates enormous ability to fight diseases when these verses are recited on us. This is known as spiritual healing. Spiritual healing is based upon our confidence in the way God has created the body and it is self-healing. It just needs a push. It just needs a push. What my son tells me, my younger one who works in, on the molecular biology, he tells me that there are certain genes in us. They're waiting to be propelled. They're waiting for a condition to be propelled. That, 
means they were propelled in a different way. Sometimes they propel negatively. And you might catch, you know, cancerous situation in your own being. Or sometimes they, you know, they propel in you healing powers. They say this happens in the stem cell research. Stem cell research and stem cell therapy. This cell, stem, cell, stem cell therapy is geared towards that kind of defeating those genes that are not conducive to save you. If this is the situation with our body, then we correctly ask this question. If knowledge is important for us to understand our own tradition, then the question comes up, what kind of knowledge is good for us about our own tradition? We go to Imam Ali to get the answer for that one. Salawat ala Muhammad. Imam Ali was constantly looking at the Muslim community of his own times in terms of how much they knew about the religion they were practicing. I am consciously seeing in Najul Balaga, step by step, Imam Ali is trying to find out what kind of religiosity informs the Ummah. Is it the right kind of religiosity that they, sh they should know about their own religion or what? For that reason, Imam Ali's efforts were directed towards exposing those who do not know very well about their religion. You might say that was an, a negative method of approaching the whole problem. What was happening in the society was that there were many people Engage in informing people about religion who are not well informed themselves. And they created a chaos in the community. The chaos is the example of the Hadith literature, by the way. You want to see chaos in Islamic knowledge? Then open the books of Hadith. From one page to another page, you will see the contradictions. And you go on examining the Hadith literature. By the way, with all due respect to the people who are really paying a lot of premium in supporting the Hadith literature, I am myself saying that our task has been to go back to the Quran rather than the Hadith. The reason is very simple. Hadith is always has a question mark in front of it because we don't know the source of it. Imagine Imam Malik in Mawatta, in the most important and the earliest compilation of the Hadith in Medina. Imam Malik, Malik bin Anas. <coughs> this is the earliest book of Hadith. And by the way, this was not the book that he wrote himself. This was the dictation to his students. He was like a professor talking about Hadith and the students, you know, collected those. And they wrote them down. The problem with Imam Malik is in Al Muwatta, by the way, English translation is available. He does not cite his source. This is very important for you and me. Because to say that Kala Ashabul Ashabuna fil Medina does not suffice the problem. If you say that our people in Medina hold this opinion, well, who are these people? Ashabuna, give us names. Tell us who are they. You can't tell us that this is the way Medina school does. Now, the beautiful part that in that collection is that it has the freedom to develop ideas in the form of fatwa, by the way. Because Imam Malik is giving it to fatwa. He gives directives. He says, this is the way you need to take care of your situation. If you have to, you know, if you are living in a state, this is the way you inherit. This is the way you write your, you know, your last will of testament. But the whole problem is that if there's no documentation, how can I believe? Especially when there are differences of opinion between what Imam Malik is saying 
than what Imam Shafi is saying. If the knowledge is, does not realign, I'm introducing a new term now, if the knowledge does not realign, that not, does not support one another in the conclusions, then you and I are left with no knowledge at the end of the day. Because we have doubt about the first knowledge, we have the doubt about the second knowledge. What are, what are we supposed to do? This is where Imam Ali is very, very helpful. He's describing the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he is very, very positive, by the way. He says, this Sahaba, they practice what the Prophet taught. They were good students of the Prophet. They knew how to protect the religion. They knew how to explain the religion. In other words, what the Sahaba did was extremely helpful for the later generations. But he did not stop there. He also said about what Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad did. What, is, what did the family do? The family were also part of the Sahaba, right? Because they were, they were living at the same time. Imam Ali, as much as Imam Ali was the Imam, Imam Ali was the, you know, the cousin of the Prophet, he was also the Sahabi. He was one of the Sahaba. Bi Fatima was also one of the Sahabi, so to speak, you know. In other words, they were all qualifying at two levels. Both were Sahaba, who were very, very careful about what they did in the religion. And Imam Ali is very, 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 very much praising them, saying they are very, they were very particular about following the religion. But the way he introduced the family is very interesting. And this is my point of reference. He said, Hum Aishul ilm This is this is very, very important critical retrieval of the tradition. You and I want to understand Bibi Fatah. We want to understand Imam Ali. We want to understand, you know, Umar Salima, you know, so. All these, you know, family connections, we want to understand them. We want to put our confidence in them. We can't do without them, by the way. I must, be, I must assure you. If I'm talking about the Quran, the Quran is presupposing the existence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, we can't understand the Quran without the Prophet. Bear that in mind. I know the context of the Quran is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the broader context of the Quran is those who practice the Quran. The problem with you and me today is that our retrieval of the tradition does not go back to the Quran, it goes back to the Sunnah. Oh, we have no certainty that the Sunnah has been preserved in the spirit of the Quran. Uh, do you have that kind of confidence? If that was the kind of confidence, Imam Hussein, in his khutbah to the army of Hur, he said, Matat Sunnah al in his own time, Imam Zain's time, in his speech to, to the army of Kufa, he says that the Quran is not being practiced and the Sunnah is dead. If this is in the 60 Hijrah, testimony of Imam Hussein al Islam saying that the Sunnah is dead, how about the later period then? It, be, it, would, could, it would be, you know, even worse than that. The function of the Allah, Allah Muhammad, the function of the, of the family of the Prophet was. And I think, I think here, Ibn Khaldun is right. In talking about the success of the Prophet, he says that Banu Hashim were really committed. Those who were committed to the Prophet were die-hard supporters of the Prophet. Not only what he did, but what he taught. In other words, they were representing the Prophet in action and in opinion. Also, there were companions like that, by the way. What I'm talking about is Banu Hashim. And Ibn Khaldun says that on worldly level, if you want to measure the success of Muhammad sallallahu then you have to take into consideration the support of Banu Hashim. Especially Banu Abdul Muttalib. 
the grandfather of the Prophet. You need that support, by the way. Now, what Imam Ali is doing is that he has already spoken about the Sahaba, that the Sahaba lived a life that was impeccable. They lived a good life as an example. What did the family do? They enlivened the knowledge and killed ignorance. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. This is a very major claim that Imam Ali is making. Aishul ilmi wa mawtul jahl. This is what the Ahlul Bayt did. They lived with the ill. That means they practiced what they knew. But they also dealt a death blow to ignorance. And then he says, This is very, very, very important. What really informs you and me is, their civility. Hill is the civility, by the way. That they were civilized leaders. Hill. They were not only learned. You know, in Gujarati we say, Gonyo Japa Gonyo Nadi. You remember this? A very small saying in Gujarati, you know. It means, you know, he's educated but doesn't have manners. Because education should bring refinement of character. That's what education does. What Imam Ali is saying that Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Ali Muhammad are not only living the knowledge which is necessary for us to derive today. You and I need to go back to those sources of the knowledge. But not only that, we also need to understand their personality. We need to understand their helm. We need to understand their civility. We need to stand, understand their manners, their conduct of life. This is where we find you know, teachers who practice what they teach are far more successful than teachers who don't practice what they teach. Isn't that true in the world? Those teachers who left a deep mark on your, you know, in your education are those who remained exemplary teachers. They lived their knowledge. You could see that. Whether it was anatomy they taught, or philosophy they taught, whatever they taught, their impression is a lasting impression. I still remember my teacher in Aligarh Muslim University, even now. I was there in 60s, from 63 to 66. The teachers I had, Professor Nabi Hadi was teaching Persian language and literature, by the way. I still remember Nabi Hadi. Simplicity, humility of the teacher, and the way the teacher imbibes knowledge before he teaches you. The modern paradigm, I'll be very blunt, it is not only unconsciously biased, but it contradicts an individual's personal reality. We, we, we want a paradigm that is real to you and me. Our needs are real needs as human person. I'm a woman who lives day and night in this society. I go out, I work, I do all kinds of things. I need that guarantee and security in my life as a woman so that I'm not molested. I'm not looked down upon. I'm not seen as something, you know, that can be teased or abused. That's a dream of every decent human being. But more so women because they are vulnerable in the society. Even today. I have told you, in University of Virginia, 70% of women are attacked by men, sexually abused. 70% of women in University of Virginia? Fuck! That's a bad commentary on the liberal educational system. 27% are actually raped in University of Virginia. Just go and open the statistics, by the way. University of Virginia. It's public. We are worried about it. <coughs> How can this society deteriorate to that level? Whereby a woman, as a human person, has no dignity, 
She can be abused. What do you mean by that? The she needs an escort after 8.30 at night. She can't walk alone from the library to her dorm. Are we living in medieval times? Where are we living? What kind of modernity is this? And I'm told the pictures is not the picture is not very rosy at the University of Toronto or other universities. It's not. And I must tell you very honestly, the picture is not very rosy also in the University of Tehran. Let's not, you know, jump to our conclusions, you know, that we are the goody goody people, you know, who don't, who don't do anything wrong in this world, you know, without other people. No. University of Masha, University of Tehran. University of Isfahan, Isfahan, University all around the world because they are modeled after the universities in the West. There is no Islamic worldview. This is what Faz Rahman said in the criticism of the Islamic universities. said, Islamic universities don't have metaphysics. They don't have a worldview. It is adopted wholly and solely without any criticism of the secular worldview. We don't allow philosophy. Yeah, University of Cairo doesn't teach Islamic philosophy. There's no Islamic philosophy, by the way. In the philosophy department in the University of Cairo, they teach Socrates and Plato, <coughs> Aristotle and Spinoza, Locke, and you know, that's what they teach. They don't teach Mullah Sadr. Oh, Mullah Sadr from Iran. Oh, that must be no, no, no. Iran. The prejudice is deep seated biases. How do we deal with that? In other words, the whole world. I'm saying that our search for a paradigm is a global search. It's not localized anymore. It's not the membership of the oil anymore. It is the larger society. Because I can talk in the church and the synagogue with the same emphasis I'm talking to you. No difference. No difference at all. And I can talk in the classroom, whether it is the classroom of politics or biomedical ethics or sociology, the emphasis and the points are well taken in all areas of human sciences. Human sciences. University is very much worried. You, did you know that universities are going to enormous changes in revisiting of the curriculum, revisiting of the, you know, categorization of different fields of study. It's a crisis, not only of leadership, but also philosophy. Because I'm in that echelon of the administrators thing, but I don't know. They, they pull me in, come talk to us. It's a crisis. We thought 2012, we should have settled all our questions in the universities. We haven't. We haven't. Because what we are seeing is destructive elements in the young people who are seeking out outlets that are not conducive to their well-being.